known as one of the most infamous and dangerous terrorists in the world. Carlos the Jackal is a name that strikes fear into the hearts of many. With his real name being Elik Ramirez Sanchez, he was born on October 12, 1949 in Caracas, Venezuela. But then what happened that made him kill not one or two, but 80 people? It's not something out of a fantasy book, it's true. And this video will reveal the truth behind the man known as Carlos the Jackal. Ramirez Sanchez, a son of a Marxist lawyer Jose Altagracia Ramirez Navas and Elba Maria Sanchez, was born in the quiet town of Michelena in Venezuela's Tachira state. But imagine a mother's heartbreak when her plea for a Christian name for her firstborn is dismissed by the father. Jose named him Elik, an homage to Vladimir Elik Lenin. His siblings too carried the weight of such names, Lenin and Vladimir. In 1959, young Elik found himself drawn into the young movement of the Venezuelan Communist Party. He began walking a new path, one that intertwined his fate with the world's most wanted list. Picture this, a young man and his father attending the Third Tricontinental Conference in 1966, followed by a summer spent at Camp Matanzas, a guerrilla warfare school on the outskirts of Havana. Soon after, his parents separated, and his mother took her children to London. There, she stepped into economics at the prestigious Stafford House College and the London School of Economics. In 1968, the Sorbonne in Paris almost became Elik and his brother's new school, but the final choice was Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, known for recruiting foreign communists to the Soviet Union. The year 1970 marked a turning point. Expelled from the university, Moscow lost its charm. It was then that Beirut, Lebanon called out to Ramirez Sanchez. He volunteered for the PFLP and trained in a camp outside Amman, Jordan. After his training days with the PFLP, Carlos found himself stranded. Jordan had ejected the PFLP and Carlos had no choice but to take his skills elsewhere. London became his new playground, a city bustling with unsuspecting potential targets. He began compiling a list, a list of names that would soon become his harrowing legacy. Kidnapping and assassination was the game, and Carlos was ready to play. His first mission came sooner than expected. The target, Joseph C., as the president of the retail giant Marks & Spencer and a prominent figure in the British Jewish community, C. was a significant target. On December 30, 1973, Carlos, gun in hand, forced his way into Seif's residence. One bullet found its mark, seriously wounding Seif. But fate was a fickle mistress. As Carlos prepared to fire a second shot, his gun jammed. Carlos had no choice but to escape for his life, leaving a seriously injured Seif behind. Then in 1974, Carlos switched gears demonstrating his strategic acumen in the planning of a daring embassy occupation. Picture this, the French embassy in The Hague, Netherlands, occupied by members of the Japanese Red Army, 11 hostages under their control. As the French government was negotiating for the safety and release of their compatriots, Carlos launched a chilling diversion. A grenade thrown into a Paris cafe and shopping arcade, resulting in a terrifying explosion that claimed two lives and wounded dozens. The French, rattled and desperate, acquiesced to the demands of the Japanese Red Army within days. But Carlos was far from done. 1975 arrived with a bang, quite literally, as he led a failed rocket attack on an El Al airliner at Orly Airport in Paris. A second attempt a week later sparked a fierce shootout with French police. However, in the chaos and confusion, Carlos slipped away into the darkness, escaping the clutches of the law once again. But the chess game of international terrorism was about to expose Carlos. His PFLP handler and co-planner of the El Al attacks, Michel Mucarbel, landed in the grip of French authorities in June 1975. As a pawn sacrificed, Mucarbel unwittingly led the investigators to the den of the wolf, the Paris apartment where Carlos was residing. Imagine this, 
Carlos playing the gracious host, welcoming the unsuspecting officers into his domain, offering them drinks and lacing the air with tension. Then, in seconds, the friendly host became the executioner. Carlos drew a machine pistol and a hail of bullets filled the air. Mukarbel and two detectives became victims of this ruthless surprise attack, while another was left seriously wounded. Suddenly, Carlos, who had been nothing more than a specter to the French investigators, was thrust into the harsh spotlight of one of the largest manhunts in history, a relentless pursuit that would stretch across almost two decades. The twisted tale took another turn when a journalist stumbled upon a copy of Frederick Forsyth's The Day of the Jackal. And so, the man previously known as Elik Ramirez Sanchez was now named Carlos the Jackal, and with this name came a legacy of bloodshed, terror, and fear. Slipping the grasp of law enforcement, Carlos fled to Beirut, where he began planning his next deadly act. It was December 21, 1975. Carlos, alongside five others, stormed a meeting of OPEC ministries in the heart of Vienna. The result was the death of a Libyan economist and two security guards, and over 60 people dragged into a horrifying hostage situation. Imagine the terror as Carlos secures an aircraft, releasing a handful of hostages, but keeping 42 captives in his grip. They are taken on a terrifying journey, getting around the globe until they finally touch down in Algiers. Here, the Algerian leadership embraces Carlos with open arms, and the world is left in shock as it's revealed that he had ransomed the safety of the hostages for a staggering sum, tens of millions of dollars. His actions, however, don't go unpunished. The PFLP expelled Carlos in 1976. But it doesn't mean that Carlos's journey came to an end with his expulsion from the PFLP. In fact, he found new alliances in unexpected places. Libyan leader Muammar al-Qaddafi and the East German Stasi extended their support to Carlos. With a base in East Berlin and a workforce of over 70 people at his disposal, Carlos was back in the game. This period marked the genesis of his own terror network, the Organization of the Armed Arab Struggle, or OAAS, established in 1978. Carlos wasn't just piecing together an organization, he was also building a family. Imagine Carlos tying the knot with Magdalena Kopp, an OAAS member from West Germany in 1979. However, their marital bliss was to be short-lived. In 1982, the arrest of Carlos' spouse, Magdalena Kopp, by French law enforcement was a catalyst for a horrifying sequence of backlash attacks. France found itself in the throes of an onslaught of deadly bombings, and even Jacques Chirac, the then mayor of Paris, was targeted in this wave of terror. The violent repercussions continued into 1983, leaving a path of devastation and widespread fear. Yet, the pressure was mounting, Western governments were closing in, and Carlos's allies from behind the Iron Curtain began to distance themselves. The game was changing once again, for Carlos and the world. Driven into the shadows, Carlos found sanctuary in Syria during the 1980s. His hosts, however, demanded silence from his notorious operations. No longer perceived as a threat, he was essentially dismissed by international law enforcement and lived a quiet life in retirement. But in the 1990s, whispers began to circulate that Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein, was courting Carlos to orchestrate a reign of terror targeting U.S. and European interests. The murmurs stirred the beast from its slumber. Western intelligence agencies resumed their pursuit of the infamous Carlos the Jackal. They traced him to Sudan, and in 1994, French agents seized Carlos, whisking him back to face the justice he had so long evaded. The courtroom drama unfolded in December 1997, resulting in Carlos being found guilty of the 1975 murders of Mook Harbel and two investigators, his sentence, life in prison. But justice was not yet done. In November 2011, 
he was put on trial once again for his alleged involvement in four devastating bombings in France during the early 1980s. The attacks had claimed over 10 lives, leaving a bloody imprint on the nation's psyche. Once more, the gavel came down, and Carlos was handed another life sentence. Yet, the specter of his past continued to haunt him. In October 2014, French authorities levied further charges against him, relating to the 1974 grenade attack in Paris that caused widespread fear and devastation. This trial came to a close in March 2017, and Carlos, the once untouchable jackal, was dealt a third life sentence. The flames of his reign of terror had finally been extinguished by the relentless pursuit of justice. So, this was the tale of Carlos, an enigmatic figure who roamed the world for almost two decades, leaving a trail of blood and terror in his way. A man who defied nations, governments, and law enforcement for far longer than anyone expected. A name that became synonymous with fear and whose story is unlikely to ever be forgotten. If you enjoyed the video, give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, let us know in the comments if you want to see more videos on similar topics. Goodbye until next time!